day. I think you can tell by the number of people squeezed into the room this morning just how, of how much interest this whole topic is to people today in America. Because right now, America stands in the midst of an extraordinary or potentially extraordinary energy revolution that can not only cut energy costs significantly with huge benefits for consumers and companies, but also potentially change the geopolitical dynamic too in terms of America's dependence on oil imports. And many of you will have heard in the last few days just how important that is in terms of the bigger picture for the Middle East now. So here to talk about the shacking revolution is, sorry, fracking revolution, um, no, fracking revolution is um, <laughs> Go Governor John Hickenlooper, on my right, your left, who's Governor of Colorado, known to many of you, and next to him, Fred Krupp from the Environmental Defense Fund. Fred's been monitoring environmental issues now almost all your life. You've been no. running the Environmental Defense Fund, I think, for 29 and a half years, exactly. Is that what you said That's earlier right. today? Yeah. yeah. And Governor Hickenlooper, as many of you know, has been very much the forefront of trying to bring um, a new approach towards fracking. And I'm going to start by asking you both to talk about that, because although many people might think that you would be essentially um, rivals, enemies, you've actually teamed up recently to try and provide a joint model for developing fracking in Colorado, which is potentially quite path-breaking and very thought-provoking. Governor, would you like to explain to us exactly how this model has developed and what it means for Colorado? Well, we started, and Fred is never shy about uh, advising governors, mayors, presidents uh, of his vision of where, what we should be doing. Uh, but I, for one, am always receptive because he represents an organization that is fact-based uh, and is willing to build alliances and be collaborative. And I think as we look at this potential revolution, and, and hydraulic fracturing is a revolution, right? I spent five years as an exploration geologist, and when you find a big field, it's a big deal. But when you have a technologic innovation like this, uh, it's like when they first figured out how to crack crude oil and put, the, put you know, whale blubber and whale oil out of business. It's, it's, it's that level of transformation. And things are changing dramatically and rapidly, and, and there are so many more wells being drilled that things that before were not so environmentally uh, destructive really are causing problems. And I, I first started talking to Fred about what, four or five years ago. Uh, and he had been serving, I'll let him talk about uh, the, the committee that they had at the White House. But a lot of the basic uh, challenges, and we, we had a list of, of several of them uh, a couple years ago, really were going to require major change. And, and the one that I think uh, Jillian is referring to was this notion of of fugitive emissions, right? Uh, natural gas and methane escaping, both during the drilling of well, during the fracking of a well, uh, but also just in, in production and collection. And we have a large uh, natural gas field about an hour north of here, north-northwest. Uh, and we could see that the air pollution was getting worse slowly, but steadily. Uh, and Fred actually was the one who kind of pushed that notion of, well, how are you going to approach this? Because the industry is very resistant to beginning to regulate methane. It, there had been no previous real regulations. And I thought about that for a few months, and he saw me again and pushed me again. And I started asking citizens about it, and it was pretty clear. I mean, universally, not only was there an appetite to really push for more rigorous regulation, but to really begin looking at what, you know, not in one year, but what would a zero tolerance look like? And how do you get to the point where you're not going to have any fugitive emissions? I mean, this, this is an asset that could be sold, right? Natural gas or methane is a valuable asset. So collecting it and making sure you don't lose it to, to the air uh, and, and have those environmental damage. You know, methane is probably, what, 64 times more destructive than CO2 uh, in terms of climate change. Uh, so basically, we sat down, and, and, and Fred pushed pretty hard, and I started talking to the uh, oil and gas industry in Colorado. We have several large companies uh, that, that do a, a large part of the drilling here, Noble Energy, Anandarko, and Canna. Uh, and, you know, there's a PR battle going on around fracking. There's a lot of misinformation. I think uh, many people in the, in the industry thought they were losing the PR battle. And they agreed to sit down. And, and my commitment to them was, if we were going to take on fugitive emissions and, and, and methane, my deal would be to try and keep as, as minimum red tape as possible uh, to make sure every dollar that they would have to spend would go towards actually making air cleaner and that they would get full credit for it. And so we sat down 
uh, basically, uh, Fred put uh, some experts from the Environmental Defense Fund, some other environmental organizations. They sat down with experts from the oil and gas industry. In the first couple of months, they just worked out the facts, right? What and, are the? And when was this exactly? How long ago did this happen? So we announced it in February. We started a little over a year ago. It, right. it was almost a 12-month process. But the first few months were just getting the facts. Right. And then once you got the facts, you know, this study said that. You know, how much pollution from this? You know, once you got the facts, then they could sit down, and it was. Very contentious, right. you can imagine. This is very expensive, the industry, but they work together. And can we just wind back for a second before I ask Fred about this? But how long has fracking actually been happening in Colorado, and just how big is it? Um, what's the total size of you know, both the shale gas and the fracking? Well, I think I just invented a new word, shacking, earlier, but, <laughs> <laughs> which is shale gas, shale gas plus fracking. But how long has the fracking industry actually been up and running for in Colorado? Well, well fracking has been, you know, I worked as a geologist from 81 to 86. We were fracking wells then, but they were just vertical wells. Yeah. So you would push this viscous, kind of almost a gel with silt and sand, it, it's kind of in suspension, push it out in the formation, it would prop open these little micro fractures then when you pull the fluid back out, the, the, the silt and the sand would hold open the microfractures and you enhance your production. Once they figured out how to do horizontal drilling, you could go and you could go out a mile or even two miles in a hard in a, in a formation that's no more than a few feet, a, a meter or two thick, and stay right within that formation, and then you frack that whole length. Yeah. Very, very successful, very, very productive. But you know, that's what really caused the change. It brought potential hydrocarbon recovery very close to suburban neighborhoods. Right. So, so, but it's fair to say that this is now a very major part of the energy complex well, in, in Colorado. Almost every well that's using horizontal drilling, almost every well today is fracked. It's right. just, it, you'd be silly not to do it. Uh, and certainly in Colorado where the, the, the fracking usually takes place a couple of miles down in the rock, uh, it, it is done properly. It is a, it is, it's an industrial, but it's a safe process. And the, the, our, our groundwater is about 800 feet, so it's a long way away from right. groundwater. So Colorado has a deeply established fracking um, industry, and the governor comes to you last year and says, help, we're worried about the emissions. No, 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 he came, trust me. Oh, you came to him. He was consistently <laughs> well, coming to me. <laughs> okay. I'm giving credit where credit's due. <laughs> All right, so what, so what were you asking for, and what did you want to do? Because many people in the environmental um, activist world today are simply saying we should not have any fracking at all, just stop all these projects, rather than try and cooperate or propose any solutions to governors? Well, Julian, natural gas is a fossil fuel, so it's not the answer to climate change. Uh, energy efficiency, renewables, wind, solar, we've got to be pedal to the metal on those things, and I agree with my colleagues in the environmental community about that. On the other hand, uh, natural gas does emit half the carbon dioxide when it's burned than coal. So as an exit ramp off of coal, uh, it's been pretty good for America. We've closed down a lot of coal-fired power plants for a few reasons, but one of the biggest reasons is because we have this ample, inexpensive natural gas. But um, what most people don't know and what I didn't know until uh, relatively recently is that while carbon dioxide gets uh, public enemy number one status, methane is responsible for a third, about 30% of all the global warming we're, we're feeling um, now around the planet, and about 30% of all that we expect to see over the next 20 years. And in fact, short-lived climate pollutants probably responsible about a half. And the oil and gas industry is the biggest industrial source of these emissions in the United States. There are other sources including agriculture and rice farming. They're not the only source, but um, they're a big source. And so uh, we know that natural gas, when it's burned, burns cleaner than carbon dioxide, so is better than coal by 50%. But what we've learned over the years is that a certain amount of natural gas escapes into the atmosphere unburned at different stages of the process as Governor Hickenlooper just said, including at the wellhead and in the gathering pipes and the uh, processing plants, even storage tanks. Sometimes we found hatch doors that are unintentionally, not through anyone being evil, but just carelessly left open. Mm. Um, and, and this methane is, is actually 84 times 
more potent than carbon dioxide over the first 20 years. It depends on the time frame. So 64 is right if you were looking at 40 years, and <laughs> 24 would be right if you were looking, or 27 would be right if you were looking at 100 years. But I care, and I think we all should care about the next 20 years, because that's when, if we could slow down the rate of global warming, we've got a chance to make other things happen. And so what we were looking to have happen, Julian, is for the governor to be the first head of any state or for that matter, any nation or any jurisdiction anywhere around the planet to say, darn it, this should not be happening. It's controllable. There's practical measures you can take. Simple, not very expensive. Um, so we asked, I asked the governor to put in place a rule. And he wanted it done in a cooperative fashion with some of the uh, folks in industry. And that's when, as he has reported, we got together in a room and started talking about the facts and ultimately hammered out something that we could bring to him and that the governor uh, proposed and that his Air Quality Control Commission adopted last February by a vote of eight to one. So how much difference has it made so far? Has it made any difference so far? And how costly has this been? Well, let me just say uh, it it's a, makes a huge difference. When this rule is fully implemented, it's being implemented in stages over the next couple of years. but. Uh, the operator, the rule is effective now. Um, smaller operators are given a little time. Uh, it will take out of the atmosphere the equivalent of taking all the cars and trucks off of Colorado's roads every year. So it's, it's that much volatile organics, not even methane, because the same measures to capture these vapors effectively capture half the volatile organics in the, in the state. And in terms of methane, um, we'll capture about 30, 34% of the methane that was being released. Another 100,000 tons, in both cases, in round numbers, about 100,000 tons. Um, so the brown cloud that um, Denver and the state had done a good job in shrinking, and which was beginning to expand, uh, now we'll see that shrink again, thanks to the leadership of Governor Hickenlooper and Noble Energy. Uh, and in Darko and in Canna. Right. I mean, Governor, did you have a lot of opposition from the oil industry um, or oil and gas industry? I mean, did they point out that this was going to be costly? I mean, what does this actually mean in terms of their operations? Well, they're, <clears throat> they're estimating, uh, I think, $60 million a year, $68 million a year. But, I mean, those companies just in Canna, and in Darko, Noble will probably invest somewhere close to $5 billion this year in Colorado. So it's a significant investment. They're very serious about their bottom lines. These are publicly traded companies that have to answer to their shareholders. But you know, they, in the end, when we announced the regulations in February, we had you know, the representatives from the environmental community, Fred came out, but we also had the senior management from the, the industry, from Encana and Anadarko and Noble, both claiming victory. And I think that's the, probably the right way to do regulation is, is you know when you're sitting down and these guys, you know, sometimes was, if you ever heard of, hear cat fights behind closed doors, you just hear the, the snarling and the rattling. And so that's what it sounded like in the room where they were negotiating on several occasions. Um, but the bottom line was, in the end, both sides claim victory. And I think that's the, the trick. Now, you know, the trick is, Governor, that um, ultimately we've got to get to a world where it's not victory and defeat. Right. It's problem and solution. Absolutely. And I think the reason we felt so good about it is, you know, thanks to you and the leadership in these companies, we were able to take a problem, understand the pack, facts, take it apart, put it back together, get to a solution, you know, that was practical. It turns out uh, we commissioned a study by ICF, a big consulting firm. What would it take in America, in the United States, to reduce emissions all over the country by 40%? It turns out what it would take is an investment of one penny per thousand cubic feet of produced gas. So a thousand cubic feet of produced gas, or about a million BTUs of natural gas, nowadays costs about $4.50. So even if that one penny is all additive, for $4.50, in other words, my natural gas bill is $120 a couple months ago, if, if in the winter, um, <laughs> had it, had this change been made and we reduced pollution by 40%, air pollution by 40%, it would have been $120.25. 
this is a tiny incremental cost. And I've come to think about it, you know, I expect the natural gas companies to be for this happening all across America because in terms of winning back the trust of Americans on these issues, methane release is not the only environmental issue involved in fracking. But if the companies won't support doing this for such a trivial cost, how can they be trusted on the other issues? Well, the good news is they are supporting this here in Colorado, and I, I hope and expect, and I'm going to you know, work my tail off to get them to support it everywhere else too. And yet, I mean, since I am paid to be a professional cynic as a journalist, um, I would point out that, yes, as you say, methane is emissions are one of the issues that people are concerned about, but there are many other issues as well to do with fracking that people worry about, whether it's the water supply, whether it's you know, causing earthquakes. I mean, one of the reasons why fracking has recently been put into standstill in the UK, for example, is because there are concerns about it creating earthquakes. So, Governor, first of all, do you see your, any sign that the die-hard environmental lobby amongst your voters are in any way reassured by this? And what are you going to do to actually address the other environmental issues in Colorado? Well, first, I think there is still a strong component or group of people that are very agitated about fracking, very concerned about it. Uh, and certainly, you know, I'm quick to say that, as Fred said, that, you know, natural gas is a transition fuel, right? We're going to consistently move to cleaner energy sources. We're going to continue to drive down the cost curve on wind and solar. Wind now, in many ways, is, is cost competitive with, with inexpensive natural gas. That's a, that's a good thing. But unfortunately, we don't always have wind when we want it. Battery technology's got, I mean, there's going to be a, a transition that's going to be five or 10 or 15 years long, but I think natural gas is a big part of that. So our job at the state is to make sure it's done absolutely safely, right? Having inexpensive fuel is vitally important to our country, to international uh, safeguards, it's for jobs, it's balance of payments, all these things. Uh, but in no way does that in any way dilute our responsibility to make sure that our citizens have clean water and clean air. So the issues we've gone one after another. So originally there was a lot of concern about frac fluid, what was in it and was being hidden. And we negotiated uh, at great length, and again, uh, Environmental Defense Fund sat down. I got uh, Halliburton to come up uh, and send their experts up, and we agreed. They were very worried about their intellectual property, giving, revealing uh, trade secrets. In the end, you know, and we, as uh, you see on a bottle of Coca-Cola, that's the most secretive formula in the world, and yet they put their ingredients on it. Right. Uh, so we got to a compromise and announced that uh, three years ago. Uh, then we looked at, you know, what are the, I mean, we don't see fracking the actual process of fracking, getting into our groundwater during fracking. We don't have earthquakes, at least in Colorado. But we do see places where they've spilled, you know, the, the, uh, 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 often sometimes some of the smaller companies that aren't as rigorous with their uh, safety procedures, or, but even sometimes a larger company, will spill frac fluid into a, into a lake or, a, or, or just into the ground, where it can get into the groundwater. Uh, and so we've increased those fines by, by more than an order of magnitude. So we went from you know, I think it was between $500 and $1,000 a day. We're now up to $10,000 a day. And, you know, I'm pretty confident that the number of small spills, that, that they just were a little careless, $10,000 a day, that's going to stop, right? Uh, so we've been going down that list. And, and right. air quality was the most recent one to say, all right, we've really worked on water. We've worked on what is in, a, in frac fluids. Uh, and now how do we begin to address, make sure so, we have clean air? So what's next for you then on this fracking issue? Well, the issue we're, we're dealing with now so that's the environmental issues, which I think are at the, the, the top of the pyramid. But we also have land use issues. So, and the way I explain this, it's in Colorado's state constitution, people who own the mineral rights oftentimes are different than who own the surface property. And our constitution guarantees them the right to go down, access that mineral, oil and gas, you know, recover what, what, what's you know, economic, and then leave the surface back in the condition it, they originally found it, with the, the least disruption as possible. Well, imagine someone's living 35 years in a suburb on the edge of town. Mm -hmm. There's a meadow across the street, and suddenly they, you know, they always knew there might be a house or two, and all of a sudden there's going to be an oil field across the street from their house. They're totally upset. Anybody in this, almost anyone in this room would agree that, that, that they have a good right to be upset at, at, at you know, an industrial practice coming into their neighborhood. But the other side, somebody owned those mineral rights for 35 years, 
and they're planning for their retirement on the value of those mineral rights. And you ask most people in this room, does government have the right to come in and snatch away those mineral rights? So we've been trying to figure out what are the mitigation process? So this is really a land use issue, right? right. How do you safeguard people? So if you're within 1,500 feet or 2,000 feet of, of a person's home or a park or a school, a, a gathering place, can you make sure that the drilling's quiet? I mean, they're so right. fast now, they get the well done. They can drill these wells in eight or 10 days. Right. But then you have a wellhead, right? you know, a bunch of pipes and, and valves and meters. We can sink that, right? If you're close right. to housing, how do we put that underground with a bulkhead? How do we have collecting tanks underground so that we minimize the impact and yet still let the person who owns the, the mineral rights have you know, the, that, that private property that, they, right. that they've always owned? Right. And just before I ask Fred about the wider implications of this experiment, I just want to ask you, where is most of the gas from Colorado now going? Is it all being used inside the state? Are you sending it across the country? Can you see a world where perhaps you end up exporting some of that elsewhere? Well, that's one of the big discussions now, and certain, some of our chemical companies would like us not to export. I believe, I think the reserves are so prodigious in natural gas. Again, this is not just one field, but it's an innovation of technology that even if, as we export it, I think the price will bounce up for a month or two or three, but then come back down as they gear up their production. Uh, so I personally, uh, our gas mostly gets, it, it's transported, but not out of the country. And in the vast majority of it not, is not transported long distances. Right. Uh, but, but you would personally support exports of, say, LNG, would you? Yeah, I, I don't have a problem. Again, it's private property. So mm. how do, should government be saying you can't export this? It's your property. It's an export that we generally encourage uh, U.S. exports as much as we can. Well, so, this appears to be one exception or one potential exception. Well, but yeah. this wouldn't be national security. And I think, yeah. I think as long as we feel pretty safe that the, I mean, it is going to help all kinds of accessory industries like, like the chemical industry. Fertilizer is, needs, is very dependent on uh, inexpensive natural gas. And we're going to see a lot of these industries that had been, been you know, outside of the central part of the, of the country, the, those jobs are going to come back to, to the central plains. Right. Well, that's a fascinating theme I want to come back to in a minute. But, Fred, when you look at um, what's happening in Colorado, do you think this could be a model for other states or even other countries, say Europe, where there really has been no fracking done yet, but where there's a desperate need to find a way to get voters to support um, fracking if they're going to find a solution to the energy problems? Yes, absolutely. And uh, it's not just the methane or the air pollution. It's We've got to get all of these issues absolutely right, because we can't ask any neighbor to um, sacrifice their right to clean air or clean water be for cheap energy. I've, uh, the governor referred to before, uh, the president asked uh, Steve Chu when he was Secretary of Energy to chart a safe path forward to develop shale. And in the process of being one of the seven people working under the chairman, um, former head of the CIA, John Deutsch, we toured um, sites. Um, I met a woman in Pennsylvania who had to leave her house because of the vapors and the fumes. Her kid was uh, living at a neighbor's house down the street, safely away from the fumes. She was temporarily living out of her car. These are heart-wrenching things that shouldn't be allowed. We need strong rules and we need compliance. So the the economic benefits for the United States are real. By the way, two-thirds of natural gas isn't used for energy. It's used in manufacturing or build, be, building heating and cooling. And um, the, the quest for a model set of rules is a really important one in the International uh, Energy uh, Agency, the IEA based in Paris, has put together the golden rules uh, for the golden age of natural gas. And we were very involved in that and we continue to be involved because especially for countries that haven't started yet, uh, whether it's the European Union, uh, the UK or China, which is now deeply dependent on coal and natural gas, if you could do it right and get the leak rate down, which I think you can as a scientific matter, now we have to prove we can in the real world, that would be an enormous benefit for their air quality. Natural gas, in addition to the economic benefits, the conventional air pollutants, by conventional air pollutants, I mean doesn't burn with sulfur, doesn't burn with mer mercury, particulates don't come out of it. So it's not an answer to global warming, but for them to um, use that instead of building more 
coal-fired power plants clearly would be better, although um, even there, as the cost curves come down on wind and solar, you know, they, building it out that is the only long-term answer. Natural gas doesn't get us there. So I'm just curious, if you look across the world of environmental activism today, what proportion of environmental campaigners do you think accept this argument that you need to be trying to work to create a more environmentally sustainable source of natural gas? I mean, do you think most of the environmental camp is with you now? Um, do you think most of them regard you as a sellout? I mean, are we talking 10%, 20%, 90%? How, how do you see yourself within the environmental movement today? Well, first of all, Julian, I think um, the question may re reflect an assumption that somehow we're pro-natural gas or pro-fracking. And actually, we're pro-safety, we're pro-health, uh, we're pro-the environment. So here's a phenomenon that's clearly happening. We're not living in denial. We recognize 28 trillion cubic feet of natural gas are being taken out of the ground every year. And we think it's essential that that be done in a way that's clean and safe for the neighbors. Should communities, uh, states like New York State, have the right not to go forward with fracking? That's their decision. But if they do go forward, it's got to be done safely. You know, in terms of natural gas, we have excess energy, uh, excess capacity in natural gas power plants. I am for increasing the use of natural gas there if we can permanently shut some of these highly dirty polluting coal plants. Uh, I am not for building new natural gas plants and locking in an infrastructure that adds you know, carbon pollution to the air, especially at a time when the cost curve of solar you know, has been plummeting and wind is already, as the governor said, competitive in many parts of the country. Well, that's fascinating. Well, I'm going to turn to the audience now and see if there are any of you have questions. Um, as ever, it would be courteous but not compulsory to identify yourself. <laughs> please, please keep any comments short or any um, questions short because uh, there are many of you in the room. I'm sure many of you would like to ask questions. And so it would be nice to get as many voices as possible from people in the room. I think there are some microphones roving. So any questions? Um, one over there to start with. I mean, you've touched on it a little bit, but excuse me. Um, something that would interest me is you're talking about fracking and the results of pollution in the air and the effects of that on global warming. Um, what's happening under the ground to the groundwater supply? Because we can have all the free, clean air we want. If we don't have water, our country becomes very poor. Um, so if you could tell me what the underlying facts are to the pollution of groundwater through fracking, um, so what that about would the be water? very interesting. There's been lots of cases where fracking has been done well and there's, there's not pollution, but there's been um, hundreds of cases where the groundwater has been polluted and that's just unacceptable. But as the governor said, and he is a petroleum geologist, so he knows what he's talking about. The, um, it's not, the groundwater hasn't been polluted from the fracking. In almost every instance, the pollution comes from spills on the surface. A truck backs into a pile of chemicals or a, or a holding pond. And you need to have, um, you shouldn't have holding ponds of wastewater. There should, they should be in sealed containers. Um, you need to have well pads that are impervious to chemicals. Or the other second leading source of the contamination that we have seen, hundreds of cases you know, have been documented, is the well shaft isn't tested after it's drilled or isn't tested properly, so the cement hasn't taken. And that well shaft does go through the aquifer, so even if you're two miles down and that's where you're fracking, the chemicals and the methane and everything goes through the aquifer, so you need an impervious seal. Absolutely, it, in a theoretical sense, it can be done safely. The thought that haunted me as a member of this Secretary of Energy Advisory Panel to chart a safe path forward was, what if I and the Environmental Defense Fund lend our name to report that says it can be done safely, 
but only in some alternate universe can it be done safely and with humans and real, wor real world conditions and 6,000 operators, you couldn't do it safely. Um, so we've dedicated ourselves at EDF, we're not just worried about the air. We're working in Texas and Pennsylvania and Ohio and to make the rules stronger um, on water and to make sure there's a system of compliance, right. which there absolutely has to be. And, and we've just, and I, Fred and I argue, I argue that we have the most rigorous set of regulations in the country in Colorado. Uh, our landscapes and our air and our water are part of the brand of the state. He says, well, I'm not sure about that. And I, I don't even want to open that can of worms. Oh, it sounds like a good can of worms yeah, to open. Yeah, well, we, I've got better <laughs> cans to open. Um, <laughs> but I, but I, here we do, we did pass in our, in, in, again, increasing our regulatory rigor. Uh, we now require that, they, that the oil company, for every time they're going to frack, they drill two wells, two water wells, uh, both before and after they, they frack, and then monitor the, the wells ongoing afterwards to make sure just to, again, as you say, the groundwater is so important to pretty much every aspect of our way of life that we can't, we have a zero tolerance. And I think the only way to do that is actually make sure we've got wells down there in the water, drill, uh, measuring water, and, and measuring it before you ever drill the well or do any fracking. We, in many parts of the state, in eastern Colorado, we have coal bed methane. Uh, these are thin beds of coal with methane gas Inter, interlaced between those beds, coming up very close to the surface and often intersecting with groundwater. Well, you could never fract or drill a, a, an oil and gas well there ever. You drill your water well, and you know if you're unlucky, uh, at a certain point you will have pulled the water out. The gas is pushing that water out. All of a sudden, you start getting natural gas coming up with your water. And and I've seen in farmers' homes where there's no oil wells anywhere, uh, they can put a match to their faucet, and it actually, when it's turned on, uh, there's natural gas coming out. Wow. We got a question there, another question there. Tom, Tom McKinley. What, are, what about propane fracking? I mean, the Canadians are using propane to frack. Do you see that as a movement that could help? Okay, for those of you who couldn't hear it, the question is what about propane fracking? Um, the Canadians are using, using that, and could that be an alternative path to go down? There are a lot of experiments being done with other gases, including gar carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide is a bad greenhouse gas, but the quantities that would be needed here are limited. In my view, it could be way beneficial compared to uh, using water. I'm not familiar with propane fracking, but I will ask our scientists. Have yeah. you heard of the term of propane fracking? I haven't heard of it, and I, and I know that, that a big part of of getting a, a frack delivery system that works is getting the right viscosity to hold the particles in, in suspension as, you, as, it, as it enters the, the formation. Uh, and I would think propane, unless it's under very great pressure, which I guess it probably is, uh, so you get under great pressure and it functions as a, as a dense fluid, right? And then you can reuse the process. And oh, okay. Sure. No, I, I, it certainly is worth looking at. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm from that school of you know, in geology, they teach you with something called the multiple working hypotheses. And when you're trying to solve a problem, don't think you've just got one problem and gather experiments to solve that one problem. Make sure you've got three or four possible solutions and then pick the experiments to get you the most information. And I'm, I'd be happy to look at something like that. I hadn't heard of it. Well, Aspen is nothing but cutting edge. <laughs> having, having invented a new word, shacking, we've now got a new, a new concept, propane. Maybe a new word. Shacking. I'm not sure it's a new activity. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, right, we have a question somewhere down. Okay, two questions, one there and one behind. Do you have a microphone? What are the cost oh, and sorry. safety projections now for new nuclear plants? Sure, should we go nuclear instead? Uh, I am, we, have, we don't have anything proposed. Uh, uh, the last nuclear plant that they tried to build, they had problems with it in the construction. They felt it wasn't going to be safe enough, and they, uh, it's sitting there just uh, St. Brain has never, it's been at least 15 years or 20 years. So I don't think we have anything on the boards. I'm, I'm out of touch with that. I don't know what. The current technology, we're building in this country a couple of nuclear power plants. Uh, the current technology is pretty expensive, more expensive than other things. So the rates for North Carolina taxpayers that will be getting part of their energy from nuclear will go up more than if they were using other forms of energy. So uh, nuclear has an advantage in that it's low carbon. To the extent we can come up 
with ways to ensure the safety, really ensure the safety of not only the process but the waste products. Uh, anyone who's serious about climate change, I think, would has to have an open mind about nuclear. But right now, the cost structure um, is not convincing. There are, are all sorts of work going on on new technologies, but most of the ones I hear about are, you know, ten years away. Right. We have, I think, a question down here. And then, do we have any more questions in the back of the room? Because I can't see that well. All right, one over there. Okay, do you have the microphone or? I do, yes. Okay, so let's do you and then do you. Good afternoon. My name's Adam McCabe. I'm a veteran advocate and a co-moderator with Huts for Vets. Uh, you had talked about clearly the dependency on fossil fuels and you're clearly taking steps to, uh, to take that down. In, in your answer, uh, one of the questions you answered, it may be five, 10, or 15 years before we really start to see a shift or see uh, much more energy production from uh, alternative energy sources. That's a long time and an abusive relationship. Wait, wait, wait. So, so, so I, I miss, if that's how you heard that, that's, I think five, 10, 15 years, that transition's happening right now. So Colorado, in the next uh, several years, we're gonna get to 30% of our energy is gonna be from renewable sources. So that, that transition's going, but to really get to a place where we begin seeing a, 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 a complete transition. I, Can you say that last piece again? And, and you will see a 30 so, 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 so it's gonna take five, 10, 15 years to really get to a point where we can envision the, the path by which we get to a, you know, a completely green energy future, right? And, then, and even that's gonna take some period of time beyond before we're completely green. It just, it's a bit, our energy industry so, is a big ship that moves very, that turns very slowly. So, so more specifically, what kind of accountability and, and stipulations are being put into place to encourage a rapid weaning off of, of fossil fuels? Well, that, and Fred could probably answer this. Do you want to answer this first, or? I mean, we still have incentives and trying to do more incentives for wind and solar. Uh, we're looking at ways to incentivize electric cars, for instance, uh, and, and, and getting uh, loan programs and grants to build more generating stations all over the state so we have a network to make, you know, that's the chicken and the egg. So each one of the different aspects of, of the different parts of our energy consumption that we're trying to get greener has their own challenges and their needs for uh, capital and sometimes their own price disadvantages. Solar still hasn't, that cost curve is coming down, but it hasn't gotten to the point where it's at natural gas yet. But it's getting there and what we want to do is make sure that we continue to incentivize it. Uh, people forget that the federal government incentivized all the research that created fracking. They incentivized the original uh, research that Benjamin Sullivan used to crack you know, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, crude oil. So there's a role for, for those incentives to continue the transition to greener energy. Is incentive the only way? Uh, you can lead a horse to water, but can you make him drink? Is there an accountability aspect that yes. can be enforced stronger? Yes, it's right. a great question, and I feel the same urgency you feel that um, enough time has been spent about what's gonna happen in 2050 or what the goal has to be in 2050 we need to know what's going to happen tomorrow in the next few years. In Texas today, 25% of their power on some days in the last year has been generated by wind energy. Pretty remarkable. President Obama has put in place June 2nd a clean power plan for the country, and, and that will require states to come up with plans to reduce emissions by 30% um, over the next his proposal is 15 years. We'd like to see that timetable telescope downward um, and the reductions to be stronger. So we'll be working uh, to make that happen before that proposal becomes final. But that will be a process that has each state coming up with their own plans, with their citizens, with their utilities, all stakeholders, to how do you bring carbon down with accountability, not just incentives. Uh, quick plug, I'll be talking Tomorrow at 5 o'clock, that will be my subject, and we'll talk more about the solar power um, has come down in price by 75% just since 2008. It's a new world, and we can make a lot of progress right now. Part of it is also trying to get different uh, collaborative groups. So uh, we had the... Um, the administrator from the EPA came out and talked to the Western Governors Association. I just finished being the chair of, of that uh, a couple of weeks ago. But there are a number of the Western governors, and governors are different than, than, than Congress or legislators because we 
the Republicans and Democrats actually get along pretty well and are willing to get things done. So we're trying to figure out what would that framework look like for the Western governors to say, all right, where do we have too many emissions? Where do we have uh, excess? You know, we're, we're doing an exceptionally good job. And is there some sort of a regional approach we can take to, to getting to the presidential standards? I mean, are there any companies in particular that are easier to work with than others? Are you talking about uh, oil and gas companies? Or? Yes, well, both, particularly oil and gas. But if you'd like to name any other names, please feel free. Well, generally, the larger companies are the, are, are the ones who care most about the reputation of the industry and their brand of their, of their company. And so they are willing to invest more money and do things right. Oftentimes, it's the smaller companies, that, the startups are, you know, companies that are trying, they just don't have the resources. They, they're on a thinner budget. And sometimes they get too close to the edge. Uh, and, and take risks that perhaps our, the rest of us would prefer they didn't. That's why we need strong regulations, right? And that's why the larger, and not just larger companies, again, we have a number of small companies that are just as visionary as the large ones. I shouldn't be that, I shouldn't keep that generalism, I shouldn't let that go too far. Right. Any more questions? We've got, got one right at the back there. Yes. You earlier made mention of the methane leakage from well sites uh, as a contributing factor to uh, global warming. Are there any figures that compare the methane, the possible methane leakage from the oil and gas wells in this country uh, to the methane, the normal methane leakage from the herds and herds of cattle, sheep, et cetera, uh, across the country? So should we be blaming the cows? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are figures. And uh, in, uh, Jillian just asked about companies that have been cooperative in addition to the companies uh, here that have been cooperative, um, Noble and Canon and Adarco, in Pittsburgh, uh, Shell, EQT, Chevron have all been part of the Center for Sustainable Shell Development. And um, many companies, including Exxon, XTO, uh, and, and others, have been measuring methane leakage. And I, I can assure you, uh, we've got figures that would convince you it's not possible, it's definite, and it's significant methane leakage. In terms of your question, comparing it to agriculture, agricultural sources, including rice and cows, is roughly equal to the oil and gas industry. So we need to work on that, and we are. Part of the President's plan on methane addresses what needs to be done in agriculture. So that's a significant source, and there are things you can do. In rice farming, you can uh, have the water sit on the rice husks for a shorter amount of time, and there's less methane. With cows, there's research going on by scientists in California to change the bacteria in the cow's guts so that instead of secreting methane, uh, it's carbon dioxide, which would be 184 uh, as potent over the next 20 just, years. How, how you, just, wait, 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 just so we're clear, that research is in Colorado. The uh, original research was in Colorado, continues, I believe, at CSU, just to be uh, perfectly <laughs> fair. And it's those of you who have ever seen those little things of Beano, right, which is a, basically a, an enzyme you take that, that keeps you from getting all the gas in your stomach. It's, it's an application like that that you would give to the grain when they feed cat, cattle in feedlots that would dramatically, not it completely, but would dramatically reduce the methane. I, I didn't realize Colorado had just, its... Uh, well, I just want to make sure that these in the facts water are all out on the table. That's good. <laughs> that, that is fascinating. So cows are eating better. Yes. It, well, <laughs> or eating, eating more, more, environment, more environmentally well. Well, they're having less what stomach about, trouble. They're having less stomach trouble. Fred, I mean, you mentioned companies which are doing well in terms of trying to join this collaborative effort. Are there companies you think which are still standing on the sidelines that are not covering themselves in glory right now? Well, we've had over 80 you know, companies and universities and academics uh, working with us to get to the science, get the facts on how much methane is coming out of the natural gas industry. We've involved them in flyovers and ground truth things. So there's been a tremendous amount of co cooperation there. But the phase, Julian, that we're at now is, is this scientific report, 16 peer-reviewed studies, which cost about $16 million to produce. As those are now being um, released, we, we now to see, need to see leadership and not standing on the sidelines, more companies saying, yeah, we can have workable regulations so that all 6,000 operators are doing this right. We know the cost, one cent per thousand cubic feet. 
it's doable, and what we need to see now is, is more leadership. And so far, outside of you know, Colorado, we haven't seen it, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we will shortly. I think we have time for just one or possibly two more quick questions. Um, no, is there? Anyone else got anything else I'd like to ask? Yeah, one behind over there. Oh, oh sorry, sir. One quick question. The states now set the requirements for uh, abandonment uh, wells and the cost to remediate those wells upon abandonment on a state-by-state -state level. Should that policy be moved to the federal government? You know, I, I'm a great believer that states are the, the, the laboratories for how things should be resolved here. I, I wouldn't have a problem with the state, with the, with the federal government setting a standard and letting each state get to, in other words, the two basic questions are one, do you charge, well, there's several, the two, I think, leading solutions to the problem of, because an old well that's abandoned, that isn't plugged and taken care of, has the future at some point to become uh, communication between hydrocarbons and water. Uh, there's no question. So it's got to be plugged properly. So should that operator plug it, which is the obvious choice, what most states have always done, oftentimes that well gets sold and sold and sold. Finally, it ends up with some very small operator who doesn't have the resources to plug it, and he won't. The other possibility is to charge a fee for every well that's drilled and have a, a plugging uh, fund that pays for an independent operator to come in and plug every single well the moment it's abandoned, which is what I think most states are moving towards. But how we do that, and each state's going to want to do it uh, in its own way to be most cost effective for its businesses. But I think the federal government certainly would be within its rights setting a standard for the type of plugging, what level it needs to be plugged, and how soon it needs to be plugged after abandonment. I mean, how much um, need is there right now for more leadership from Washington on this issue? I mean, does leadership from the White House make things worse or better at the moment? My view is that the problems are, continue to be real. Uh, there has been you know, movement to address them, but we need leadership from Washington. The president's talked about doing something about methane, for example. We need leadership at the state levels, as we've had here from the governor, and we need leadership at the local levels, too. They have their traditional uh, zoning authorities. They have their traditional role to play. Right. You've got a question back there, I think. Do we know any facts related to earthquakes in Oklahoma related to fracking? I'm not familiar with the situation in Oklahoma, but uh, Mark Zobeck is the Stanford University professor who uh, was on the, the uh, Secretary Chu's commission with me, and he's a geologist. And there's no question um, in his mind, and many papers have been published, Fracking itself, again, does not cause earthquakes. But the fluid that you take out, the frack fluid, about a quarter of the fluid comes out. When you inject that, if you, depending on where you inject it, uh, you put more pressure in the ground, and that does cause tremors. Many of the tremors are about the size of if you drop a bowling ball from your chin to the ground. But it, when you start detecting the smaller tremors, or if you're not detecting the smaller tremors, as some states do not yet require, and you keep injecting the water, then you can have earthquakes of 4.0 or higher. So earthquakes can be caused by the derivative activities of fracking if you don't have a safety net in place to measure the tremors and stop the minute you start feeling even the smallest tremor. And I think that that and this is, where, this is a good point for me to clarify that I was not a petroleum, I did not study petroleum geology in school, I was a volcanologist. I hold my ah. hand up high. Uh, but we spent a lot of time looking at how... Apologies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're um, inflating your resume. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or diminishing, I don't know. Depends on their audience. Uh, but I think that, that, that and what Fred's talking about is the disposal wells, where you have produced fluid oftentimes, or frac fluid or whatever, and there's, there are old wells where they've taken out hydrocarbons and they're pushing these fluids back in, and sometimes under great pressure, and those clearly are getting up to a pretty significant, uh, you know, 4.0, 4.2, those are, you can feel those, and they certainly make you concerned about future disturbances. I think most of the, mo the industry is moving towards, so in Colorado, Noble, Anadarko, and Canada, they probably drill over half our wells, and they recycle. They're up to now 95, 99% of, their, of the frac fluid they use. They're figuring out how to, 
how to clean it up a little bit, how to put the additives back into it, and, and so that it's just as good as it was originally, and they don't have to have that, that level of disposal. Right. And I think that's the, again, each of, this is such a new technology that each of these issues, I think they, we just have to go at them, uh, you know, hammer and tong, and, and, and be rigorous and say, all right, we're going to have zero tolerance. We, we want to have, if you're going to be close to where an earthquake or where uh, or any disturbance would matter, you've got to be totally green. That's fascinating. Well, I think we are out of time. So I'll say from my point of view, I have three key takeaways from what's been a fascinating discussion. Firstly, that fracking is big news. It's a big part of the um, increasing energy complex. Secondly, I think we've heard a lot about how the technology is changing pretty fast. And thirdly, what's fascinating is that the type of discussion between business and environmental groups and the government is changing very fast too. And there's clearly a lot more room for experimentation um, both in terms of the technology and in the levels of collaboration which we're seeing today. So thank you both very much indeed for sharing your story. Sure, nice and job. best of luck. Thank you.